Uh, this evening I want to talk about cultivating generosity. Generosity plays a fundamental part in the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha sees generosity as a, a universal human value, something that goes way beyond the confines of Buddhism. But he also sees it as the um, foundational Buddhist virtue, the virtue on which the whole edifice rests. It's quite fundamentally important. The term you usually hear is dana. Dana literally means gift or giving. And then you have the term chaga. Chaga is the underlying virtue of generosity itself. So the Buddha distinguishes between the gift and generosity. You can see how it's quite possible to give without generosity, to give something away because you want to get rid of it. It would not be a gift that would cultivate generosity. To give because it's the done thing. To give because it looks bad if you don't. So there's all sorts of motives for giving that might not necessarily have anything to do with generosity. But there are certain types of giving that generate generosity, that cultivate this underlying virtue. So dana, the gift or the act of giving, is the practice. We can practice dana. We can practice giving. And this is the practice which leads to the result of cultivating generosity, of becoming a more generous person. What underpins the, the Buddha's understanding of the gift of dana is the economy, what we could call the economy of gift. In other words, for the Buddha, the gift does not exist in isolation. It's part of a much broader economy, a complete system of giving and receiving. And this economy of gift is not something that we're familiar with. We are raised in and greatly influenced and, and formed by the economy of the market. And we take the economy of market to be the natural form of human organisation. In fact, of course, that's what the economists and the politicians and the journalists keep telling us. But in the Buddha's time, the Buddha lived at a time when the economy of the market was certainly emerging, but the traditional economy of gift was still operational. And so people lived in two economies and they understood both of them and the movement between one and the other. But we have forgotten the economy of gift. Sometimes it's dismissively referred to as primitive barter economies. <coughs> but the economy of, of the gift is, is a discrete economic system which we are not familiar with. So we need to get a sense of, of where the Buddha is coming from to understand what he takes for granted when he's talking about dana, but that we miss completely because we have no idea of, of this background. We could say that the economy of gift ha runs on three fundamental principles or assumptions. The first is, there is no such thing as a free lunch. The second is, receiving is central. And the third is, everything circulates. So let's go through these three basic assumptions. The first one is, there is no such thing as a free lunch. In other words, whatever we receive as a gift is meant to be returned. And this is, this is absolutely fundamental. And both the gift itself and the returning of the gift involve the other. It involves somebody else. So the gift in, in, always involves relationships. Now, this sense of that whatever we receive as gift is meant to be returned, this is a deeply human response. Essentially, to receive a gift is to receive care. It's to receive evidence of care. Now, what happens when we recognise that we have received the care of someone else? The, the natural human response is to return that care, to care for that person. The natural human response on receiving a gift is the felt obligation to return it in some way. And it's at this point that we enter into community. Community is based on mutual care. In other words, mutual gift. And this sense that I have 
that I must return the gift is my entry into community. And of course, community is the only place where a truly human life is possible. If we don't return the gift, then we remain trapped within self-enclosure and self-obsession. We become just atomized units of production and consumption. In other words, we remain trapped in the economy of the market. So whatever we receive is meant to be returned. Secondly, receiving is central. There cannot be a gift without the receiver because it's the receiver who completes the gift. In our culture, we have this the virtue of charity and we have charities and we give to charity. And charity in this sense is, 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 is a very cold virtue because it contains a sense of disrespect, a sense of disdain for the one who's receiving. Somewhere in the, in, I think it's in the Gospels, it says it is better to give than to receive. And this is something which has influenced, this attitude has influenced the, the Western approach to the gift. But why is it better to give than to receive? Could it be that there's a sense that to admit to being a receiver is to admit to being inferior to the giver. That the giver has some sense of superiority, maybe not stated, but there's this feeling of, well, I'm the giver, so I, I'm better. And therefore, an embarrassment on the part of the receiver, and maybe even an embarrassment on the part of the giver. So to give a gift to someone is almost like insulting them. But a gift is meant to enhance the ties of community. Dana is always an act of respect. A gift is a public statement of relationship. It's a public statement of mutual dependence and mutual esteem. A gift is a statement that both parties, the giver and the receiver, are part of the same community, sharing the same basic values and concerns, engaged in the same project, and are bound together with ties of mutual respect. The receiving is absolutely essential. There can be no gift without the receiver. There can be no virtue of generosity without the receiver. Secondly, of course, since the gift is always meant to be returned, the receiver becomes the giver, and the giver becomes the receiver, and the receiver becomes the giver, and the giver becomes the receiver. Giver and receiver are engaged in a dance with each other, and this, this dance benefits both of them individually, but it also benefits the community of which they're both a part. And that leads us to, to the third assumption underlying the economy of gift. Everything circulates. In other words, when we practice the gift, we begin to see that nothing disappears when it's given. Because we're all caught up in this economy of gift. Whatever we give has a habit of returning usually in, in magnified form for either better or for worse. What we give and how we give is important because it has real results for us as well as for others. The gift shows that we are a member of this community. The relationships within this community are always dynamic, always shifting and changing. And the movements, the totality of the circulation of the gift is something which is beyond our control. There's no individual controls this economy. Each one of us has their own private agenda in giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. But the economy of gift, in which both giver and receiver are swimming, 
operates independently of our wills because it's much bigger than both of us. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Receiving is central and everything circulates. I'd like to begin by just briefly talking about receiving. The act of receiving. And it's, it's, it's important to talk about it because this tends to be the aspect of the gift that we're most uncomfortable with. We're often more uncomfortable to receive something than we are to give it. So from the point of view of the receiver, faced with the gift. First of all, it's clear that gifts don't come to us simply because we want them. The gift comes from the other. And as a result, it is not under our control. This fact is a source of anxiety, precisely because the other is not under our control. And so we're, we're anxious about it. But in order to receive a gift, we have to allow the other ownership and control over whatever it is that they choose to offer. It's in a fundamental sense, it's not our business what the other gives to us. It's their choice, it's their decision. And for us to receive, we have to give them the freedom to do it, to make that decision. We've all had the experience of receiving a gift, say at birthday or Christmas, and we open it up and think, oh God, <laughs> and then we smile and we say gee I really want that <laughs> I was hoping you'd give that to me <laughs> and this is of course part of, part of the act of, learning, of receiving graciously if we, if we looked at it and said oh god that's awful and chuck it away and look around and say what's next we know this would be a terrible thing to do because it's a public insult. It's a statement saying, you, you, you are of no concern to me whatsoever. I don't care about you. What the other has to offer us may not be what we want. But in the economy of the gift, what we want is of no consequence whatsoever. What's important is receiving. That we receive, and how we receive. The gift comes from the up beyond the self, and therefore it's out of our control. In fact, we c you could say that anything that comes from beyond the self is gift. So, for example, awakening, enlightenment, comes as a gift. And it's our job as practitioners to be ready to receive it. What comes to us in presence is a gift because it's not under our control. And much of the, the art of the practice is learning to receive whatever comes gracefully instead of constantly complaining about it and rejecting it. The emphasis in the economy of gift in receiving is not on grasping what we want but learning to receive whatever the other has to offer, regardless of what it might be. Similarly with giving, what we give ceases to be ours as soon as we give it. As soon as it's handed over, it's gone. And it has a life of its own. And we don't know what's going to happen to it or as a result of it. It's out of our control. We can track what happens as, as a result of the gift. Certainly, the gift brings us into relationship with the other. And we can, we can see what kind of relationship that is and how it develops. What's important in, in giving is our intentions in giving and our responses and the response of the receiver. In terms of the act of giving itself, the giving itself should be graceful. And in the economy of the gift, the act of giving is cultivated as an art form, 
as is the act of receiving. Both should be done gracefully. And the Buddha describes graceful giving as having these characteristics. Giving carefully, giving with one's own hand, giving with respect, giving what is valuable, and giving with the view that something will come of it. So I'd just like to go through these five aspects. First of all, giving carefully. What do we mean by giving carefully, giving with care? I think essentially the Buddha is talking about giving with presence, being present to the act of giving and the consequences of that act. So giving mindfully. Being present to people and situations rather than being absent from them. This mindfulness of giving teaches us a great deal about ourselves, what is our inner state in the act of giving, what's going on in there. And it also teaches us about the other. How does the other respond and what happens as a result of the gift? From this watchfulness and this care comes a sense of the appropriateness of the gift. What gift is appropriate in this situation? And we become alert to intention and result in the gift. So, for example, in terms of result, does our gift develop our generosity or not? Here we have the connection between the practice of the gift and this underlying virtue of generosity. What's the connection? How does giving stimulate generosity? For the Buddha, uh, what gives rise to generosity is happiness in the gift. If we are happy in giving the gift, if we are happy to give, if we enjoy the gift, we will develop generosity. If we don't enjoy it, we won't. And the Buddha speaks of three aspects of happiness that arise in giving. The first is the happiness that precedes the gift, anticipating the gift. Then there's the happiness during the act of giving. And this has to do with enjoying the connection with the receiver. And thirdly, the happiness after giving, as we reflect on our action and rejoice in it. And it's this happiness that stimulates the, the, the virtue of generosity. For example, one of, the, one of the questions that comes up about dana in meditation retreats, the, the perennial question is, how much should I give? Now, this is a question which cannot be correctly answered. There is no right answer to this question. And it's not because of the varying amounts that are possible. It's because it's the wrong question. And so whatever answer we give is the wrong answer. It's the wrong question because it's the question belongs in the economy of the market, not in the economy of the gift. In the economy of the market, we buy and there's value. You know, we pay too much. Or if we pay too little, we feel really happy. If we apply this to the economy of gift, we think, well, how much should I give? Well, I suppose I'll give this much. I think I can get away with that. You know, I won't be embarrassed by that. And so we give and we go away thinking, oh, that was great. I got away with that one. Or, if we give too much, you know, we feel under pressure. End of the retreat, we're feeling hallelujah brethren. Sign the big check, hand it over. And then later on we think, oh God, I shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. Now, in both cases, there is no happiness after the gift. There's no rejoicing in the gift. And so, generosity is not being cultivated. The problem is that we've allowed the economy of the market to pollute the gift. How much should I give? Simple. What would make me happy? What would I enjoy giving? That's how much. Giving with one's own hand. Now, giving with one's own hand is an aspect of care. Because to give with one's own hand means 
paying particular attention to the quality of the encounter, being there for the encounter with the other. Of course, in our culture, we do a lot of giving, for example, electronically. If you're giving to the tsunami appeal, it's not really practical to get on a plane and fly over to Asia and wander around looking for someone and saying, here, take this. So we give to an appeal. We don't give by hand. The Buddha, of course, is living in a much simpler society. But still, the basic principle applies. If it's possible or practical to give with our own hand, it's a good idea, because when we do that, we have a living encounter with the other, with the receiver. Some forms of, of giving are very careless. So, for example, putting thing, things in charity bins, dump it, drive away. It's a very careless form of giving, and it's unlikely that we would drive away from that bin more generous than we were before we got there, because there's no real encounter with the bin. <laughs> if we are present for the gift, and if there is a genuine connection, so that the body and mind are both fully engaged in the act of giving, and, of course, with the act of receiving, because they go together, then it's much more likely to, for there to be a, a stronger impression on the mind stream, on the citta. So the citta is much more likely to be affected by the gift. And therefore, it's much more likely that generosity is awakened as a result. And again, it's the pleasure of the gift. It's the enjoyment of the encounter and the pleasure that, that comes from it. And of course, such uh, giving with one's own hand enhances the ties of community, which is a fundamental purpose of the gift in the first place. Third, giving with respect. The gift is always based on respect. We respect the other and what the other stands for, and we want to be part of that. That's why we give the gift. The gift is a statement saying, I am with you here. I, I wish to be part of what you are engaged in and what, in, in what you are doing. I want to share this. In traditional Buddhist cultures, of course, when you see people giving to the ordained Sangha, they give with enormous respect. I can remember, remember when I was a monk in Thailand going on arms round each day. And it's particularly the case outside of Bangkok. In Bangkok, it's a bit, it's getting a bit dodgy on the arms round. But um, in the country, in, in country towns, I was staying at a, a wat in Lampang, which is a town in a, the province just south of Chiang Mai. I was staying at a study monastery. And every day would go on this particular route through the town on arms round. And some mornings, you know, you've got to get up ridiculously early for this. And some mornings, of course, it's pissing down with rain or it's cold and you think, oh, God, you know, do I have to get up and tramp through the mud? So off you go. And, of course, you come to these houses and there are these people outside in the rain, six o'clock in the morning, umbrella up, freshly cooked food. They've been up a lot earlier than I have cooking this stuff. And it's good stuff. And I'm standing there with getting it in the bowl, and they're on the ground, handing it over. And the only reason why they're doing this is because I'm wearing the robe. They don't know me from Adam. I've never spoken to these people in my life, except to chant a blessing at the end. And you receive this gift, and you think, God, I better work hard today, <laughs> because to justify this payment, I need to, to do something. So this is, this is how it works in, in a very traditional setting, uh, and respect is, is, is very much part of the gift. But even when the receivers are not somebody special, like the ordained Sangha, still respect is an essential part of the gift. The sutras describe six categories of people to whom, in particular, one should give. And these are contemplatives, priests, destitutes, travellers, wanderers, and beggars. Now, contemplatives and priests, samanas and brahmanas, these are the professional religious 
at the time of the Buddha. So these are the ordained Sangha and also would represent the, the, the lay Dharma teachers who live on gift and who, who, whose job it is to keep the, keep the whole thing running. And of course, there is respect in the gift. Then you get destitutes and beggars. Now these are people who are, suff- who are, who are in suffering poverty and therefore they require the gift but they are not possessed of any particular virtue. You know, they may or may not. But they're, they're not like the, the contempl- contemplatives and the priests in, in that sense. Then you get wanderers and travellers. Now these are singled out because, of course, in the Buddha's time, there were very little, few facilities for travellers. And so if you were on a journey, you might well find yourself temporarily destitute. You know, in, in serious difficulty because you don't ha- you didn't have the, the network of accommodation and electronic money and so on and so forth that that we have. Clearly, the professional religious and the lay dharma teachers should be treated with respect. That seems fairly obvious. But what about the destitute and the travellers? They also should be treated with respect. In other words, a gift should never be given in a way that belittles the receiver. The receiver should never feel inferior or insulted or of less value as a result of receiving the gift. If that happens, the gift has been given very badly. And certainly the gift will return, but not necessarily in a form that the giver might wish. Instead, if we give with respect, the receiver feels welcome. And if the receiver feels welcome, then in that moment there is the opportunity, the chance of a genuine human encounter, of something happening between the giver and the receiver. And when you have that encounter, then you have the happiness in the heart that results in generosity in the giver and also in the receiver. When we talk about respect, often what it comes down to is the quality of our mindfulness in the act of giving and receiving, of being there for the encounter. If we are to treat the receiver with respect, regardless of who he or she is, this means that we have to cut through our routine assumptions of who this person is and be willing to really pay attention to the situation and to admit that maybe we don't know who this person is. We think we do. We assume that, well, we know this kind of person. But maybe we don't. To be open to possibility, to be open to surprise, to be open to an unexpected encounter, this is part of the mindfulness of of the gift and part of respect. If our assumptions are under suspicion, then we have to be very careful, very attentive to the signs to find out what's really going on. Of course, this is the attitude that we need in our meditation practice. We assume we know what's going on. We assume we know what this breath is like. But do we? If we're genuinely open to the encounter, then we're ready to be surprised for something quite unexpected to happen. In our practice, we're cultivating that attitude at, a, at the, as it were, the microscopic level, but in the, in, in the gift, we're cultivating it at the social level. And then giving what is valuable. Giving what is valuable is an aspect of respect. We don't give what we wish to get rid of. We give, rather, what we ourselves value. Again, you know, going back to the traditional gift giving in Buddhist countries, when lay people give to the ordained Sangha, they give what is valuable, they give the best. Often the food that, that if you're either a monk or a nun, or if you're a lay meditator in one of the meditation centres, often the food that you're eating, which has been provided either directly or indirectly by the supporters of the centre, the food that you eat is a gift, even if you're a layperson. 
often the food that people give is food that they normally would not eat. They would only eat this on special occasions. It's usually the best. When I was in Mahasi Centre in, in um, Burma, it's like you go in two meals a day and every meal is a feast. It's astonishing. Especially when you get out and have a look around the country and see what most people eat. It's incredible, the spread that they put out for the meditators. But for the people, it's just obvious. They're meditators. You give them the best. It's obvious. Again, this, this kind of giving generates happiness in the gift, and so generosity. It also cultivates renunciation, a letting go of the desires. There's a story in the, in, in the discourses that illustrates the importance of, of this attitude in giving. The story is, is found in Payasi Sutta, in Diga Nikaya, and there's a whole story revolving around Prince Payasi, which I won't go into, but towards the end of the discourse, Prince Payasi is converted to Buddhism. And as a result of, of this, he, he is, decides he's going to practice dana. So he establishes a charity to distribute alms to those in need, and he appoints his servant, Uttara, to be in charge of this charity. So Uttara is the guy who's handing out the stuff. And he's handing out clothes and food to people in need. But Uttara is quite horrified by the, by the quality of the stuff that he's being given to hand out. And he complains to his employer, Prince Payasi. He says to Prince Payasi, you yourself would never wear these clothes or eat this food. And Prince Payasi gets the message and so he then authorises Uttara to distribute, quote, food such as I eat and clothes such as I wear. So things go on. If eventually, of course, both men die. And, and of course, both are reborn in heaven as a reward for their generosity. And of course, Buddhists have not just one heaven, which Christians have. Buddhists have lots of heavens. Uh, there's lots of choice. And there's a hierarchy of heavens. And so the higher heavens you get reborn in are the better ones. Payasi, who's the guy who established the charity and who paid the bills and whose property was handed out, was born in a lower heaven. Uttara was born in a higher heaven. Although Uttara was a paid employee, just doing a job. And the, the discourse says that this was because Payasi, who received the reward of his gift, but a lesser reward, had because, that was because he had given grudgingly, not with his own hands, and without proper concern, like something casually tossed aside. Whereas Uttara, who was born in a higher heaven, because he had, he had given ungrudgingly, with his own hands, and with proper concern, not as something tossed aside. So the gracefulness of the giving is very much emphasised. In the, in the tradition. And you can see how in this story value and respect are intertwined. If we respect someone, we will give something of value. If we disrespect someone, we won't. Alternatively, if we give what is valuable to us, we will treat that encounter and that gift with respect because what we're giving is valuable to us. And of course, when we treat people and things with respect, then we learn to value them more than we did before. And then giving with the view that something will come of it. Now this refers to right view, samaditi, and especially the view of, of karma, karma vipaka, action and its consequences. Whatever we do, Whatever action we have has consequences, and these consequences are real. The choices that we make help form ourselves and our world, and this is just part of the way nature works. Hence the, this I whole idea of the economy of gift, that whatever we give will come back to us in some way. The cultivation of generosity changes the world within which we live. It increases the, the, the ties of community so that the people 
around me find themselves living in a better world. The cultivation of generosity changes me as the giver and the, as the receiver and it changes the world that I live in. When I cultivate generosity, I discover, for example, that I live in a much more abundant world than I thought I did. My normal response to the world is I think of myself as, as separate and as, as lacking and as vulnerable. And so I have to protect myself from want, from deprivation. And I have to defend what I have. And so I develop a degree of paranoia and aggression in order to defend myself against a, a hostile world. But when I give, when I cultivate generosity, I learn that the world is quite different from what I thought it to be because I discover that whatever is given does return. It never disappears. And in learning to give, of course, I learn to receive. I learn to open up to what the world has to give me. And in learning to receive, then... I learn to acknowledge my dependence upon others. I learn that I'm not independent, that in fact I'm radically dependent. And I discover that this is not weakness, this is strength, that I don't have to defend myself against the world. Rather, I discover that the world supports me when I support the world. And so, in practicing generosity and in deepening the, the bonds of community, I discover within that a sense of security that no amount of possessions could ever have bought me. Cultivating generosity gives us entry into the economy of the gift. And this is a community where we recognize the other as sharing the same fundamental humanity and the same fundamental concerns. The economy of the gift expresses the deep sense of mutual care that all of us require if we are to flourish as human beings. It stimulates good friendship, kalyana mittata, which the Buddha saw as so fundamental to humans that he said, I have taught the Dharma well for one with good friends, good companions, good comrades, and not for one with bad friends, bad companions, bad comrades. The Dharma is medicine, but like any other medicine, although it's powerful, it only works in certain conditions. It only works in community. And community is defined by friendship. The Dharma is never complete without action beyond self-enclosure. When we're meditating, for example, and we're lost in our personal narratives, we are locked down within ourselves. We are lost in self-enclosure. When we break out of that, we break out of self-enclosure. The gift is a way of breaking out of self-enclosure, of connecting with the other, with the community. When we act towards others beyond the, limit, the limitations of self-enclosure, we act as good friends. And when others return this, they act as good friends. So the gift and friendship go together. And of course, this is obvious because if we ask, well, what is it that good friends do? Well, they care for each other. And if we ask, well, what is care? It's a gift, freely given and freely returned. The gift and the economy of gift is fundamental for the Buddha. If we bring it back down to our situation here, this whole retreat is a manifestation of the economy of the gift. True, money was charged and a place was hired and so on. So we have one foot in the, in the economy of the marketplace. 
But this retreat would not have occurred except as an expression of the economy of the gift. The people who organised it are not going home tomorrow counting the money that they've earned and thinking this was a shrewd career move. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the everything that's been done to actually bring this together has been gift. Every manager coming in each day, every moment, every minute that they spend here is a gift. Every encounter is a gift. And you can see among ourselves, how is it that we manage to get through the week smoothly without actually killing each other? <laughs> Despite lots of provocation, I'm sure, on the odd occasion. Because we're treating each other with care. And each act of care is a gift. And the gift has been returned. And so the smoothness of the whole operation is a manifestation of this economy of gift. It's formalised in the gifts being given to me. Because what I do is a gift. And in giving, I receive. And one of the things that I've learned living on gift when I started, I was very embarrassed about receiving. And I make it my practice to learn how to receive. And I've, I've come to enjoy it. And I've come to enjoy the encounter. Uh, and of course, people give in all sorts of ways. The economy of the gift is something that we are not familiar with, so we're learning our way into it. I'm learning my way into it. Uh, it's not something that comes natural to us because of uh, the conditioning that we bring from the marketplace. But it's something that we need to learn. It's very important. It's not something to be dismissed. Nor is it to be dis you know, regarded as just something for beginners. It's quite profound and has a great deal of depth. So I keep coming across these little envelopes. <laughs> And uh, thank you very much. I've, uh, I'm very grateful for it. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here. And I hope to come back again. So thank you very much.